Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Ollie. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Warwick in the UK. Now today we're going to be talking about something quite topical, which is the coronavirus COVID-19 vaccine. And since we seem to be living through one historical disaster after another at the moment, I felt like it was probably the right sort of thing to be making a video about. So today we're going to be going through what actually is the Pfizer vaccine, how does it work, and how does all of this relate to the ongoing UK and obviously worldwide situation with COVID-19, as well as the process of actually getting and receiving the vaccine and the changes to the UK's vaccination schedule with regards to this new vaccine. Now, obviously it's really important here to note that I'm not a doctor. None of what I'm about to go through constitutes medical advice and should not be taken as such. If you have medical questions or questions specifically about this vaccine, side effects, the ingredients, things like that, please, please, please speak to your doctor, nurse, primary care provider. These people are the right people to talk about if you have concerns about getting the coronavirus vaccine. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. But this is a really, really sensitive and important topic, and as such, we need to get it right. So firstly, let's go through what is an mRNA vaccine? And I am just going to be drawing some things out here as we go along that should appear on the screen to try and keep things as simple and easy as possible. Because to best understand how this mRNA vaccine actually works, we're going to quickly go through how traditional vaccines work and how all of this relates to the development of this very new, very interesting type of vaccination. So in the general case, we have one of two, I would say, broad mechanisms available to us when we've made traditional vaccines in the past. If we want to make a vaccine to a particular microorganism that could cause us harm, which we sometimes refer to as a pathogen, we can either take an inactivated or what we call attenuated form of that bug, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, we chemically weaken it and then we put it into the body. Because it's weakened, it can't do any of the things it would normally want to do, which might be produce toxins or infect our cells. It can't do these things. But because it's recognized as foreign by the body, you know, our white blood cells come along and think, mm, I've not seen this before. This doesn't belong here. We need to get rid of it. And this is done by looking for foreign materials, these cell surface proteins called antigens, which our body doesn't like effectively. So normally what happens when your body encounters a disease for the first time, let's say the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, you have an initial reaction and you can feel pretty grotty and unwell. This is your body putting preliminary measures in place, a very acute reaction. We know that something is wrong, but we don't know what quite to do about it. But then we start to develop what's called antibodies, and this is the critical phase when it comes to immunity. And these are another set of proteins that are gonna bind on to these antigens on the surface of the virus or bacterium. And you can think of it a bit like a lock and key mechanism. This is a bit of an oversimplification, but if the antigen is a lock, which we need to unlock, we need to make a specific key to go in that lock. And that's what our antibodies are in this analogy. Because once we've opened that lock, our body can start to break down these invaders, but we can't do that until we have these very targeted specific antibodies. And every illness or every pathogen that might cause illness has its own antibodies that need to be developed to lock on to its specific antigens. So let's say our bacterium or our virus has come in, the body has noticed that it's there, then it starts to develop these antibodies. Once it's got them, it clears away the virus or bacterium. We don't feel ill anymore. But the crucial step that comes now is that we have what are called memory cells. And these memory cells essentially remember the instructions for how to make particular antibodies so that the next time we come into contact with that bug, the body can say, I remember this, this is the antibody that we need to make, let's make it really quickly before Ollie becomes really unwell. And this is how immunity works. And the other way that we might approach this same problem is that instead of using a weakened or an activated form of the bug, is we simply take a very small part of it, which is usually that surface antigen, for example, so that even though our body has never seen the virus or bacterium before, it still recognizes the antigen when it comes into contact with it, and it can make antibodies in exactly the same way. This method's been very successful for use with various diseases, including rubella, measles, mumps, tetanus, polio. The incidence of all of these diseases has fallen drastically since we started vaccinating against them, because there's essentially no chance for the person to become unwell, because the body already knows what it's looking for long before 
the pathogen has any chance to do anything to us. So with that out of the way, now we need to talk about mRNA vaccines. mRNA, or messenger RNA, is essentially an instruction sheet that tells the body how to make something. Our cells contain structures called ribosomes, which are essentially cellular factories that make proteins. You give them a set of instructions and then they build whatever protein you've asked them to make. Now, normally these instructions would come from our DNA, the sort of building blocks of code that tell the body how to make and replicate itself. So our DNA is essentially like a big database of how to make all the different proteins that we need. You'll take out specific bits if we need to make a particular protein. That gets turned into messenger RNA, which acts as the messenger and goes to the ribosome, these cellular factories that can then make the protein that we need to make. In this case, all we're doing is bypassing the need to use DNA and we're introducing mRNA right away to go to the ribosomes. So we're effectively introducing an external set of instructions from the outside world, but our ribosomes can make in exactly the same way. Now, in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, these instructions actually tell the body to make one of the spike proteins that exists on the surface of coronavirus. So what happens is if we have one of our cells, it reads these new mRNA instructions and says, okay, boss, you want me to make this spike protein? So I'll make it. So we then get loads of this spike protein. And then just because of the way this protein works, it moves to the surface of the cell. So the cell that builds it then presents these spikes on its surface because it's been told to make them. And that's what it does. But then what happens just in the same way as before is that white blood cells, the immune system comes along, notices these spike proteins on the surface and says, mm, don't like the look of these, don't know what they are or where they came from because obviously the instructions to make them weren't from your own body, they were from the vaccine. And so we mount an immune response in exactly the same way, even though there's no coronavirus here, because the body has seen these spike proteins which look like they belong to a coronavirus, we mount the immune response, we start to build antibodies, and then crucially, we remember those antibodies in our memory cells for the next time a real spike protein from a real coronavirus comes along. And this is how the vaccine can make someone immune to coronavirus without them ever having come across or been infected with a coronavirus before. We've essentially tricked the body using these outside instructions into making coronavirus spike proteins to tell the body what it needs to look for. The body thinks it's already seen a coronavirus. So now how is it given? How do you actually receive the COVID vaccine? It's delivered as an intramuscular or IM injection is what you'll hear people referring to it as. And we don't just give it straight into a vein as a large dose. We need a slightly sustained release over time. So we need to deliver it into a good big muscle with a good big blood supply. You know, obviously in my case, they had loads of choice, but in this instance, it was my left deltoid muscle. It doesn't hurt if it's done by someone well-trained. It feels like a slight scratch at most if you're nice and relaxed. And importantly, because I know loads of people are worried about side effects or allergic reactions, in every single case, you have to be monitored for 15 minutes after you've had the vaccine just to check that you don't have an anaphylactic or allergic reaction. It is the case that people who have had allergic reactions to vaccines in the past shouldn't receive this one, but just in case something happens, you will be looked after in the immediate period following just to be safe. And once you've had your vaccine, you'll receive a card like this one here. So this says that I've had my first dose. It has the batch number of the vaccine that I received, the date it was given and the name uh, so obviously COVID-19 Pfizer BioNTech, BioNTech being the German biotech company that developed it. And then we've got this second appointment date because we know from the trial data that this vaccine reaches maximum efficacy or effectiveness after two doses. And the interval used in the trial was actually 21 days or three weeks. What the UK government has decided to do is extend this period now to 12 weeks because we know based on the data that you are conferred some degree of immunity after the first dose. Even if you haven't had both doses, you get some degree of partial immunity from one dose. So based on my understanding of what's going on, they are prioritizing giving as many people as possible their first dose to provide partial cover to as many people as possible to drop the incidence and infection rates. And then in 12 weeks, you'll receive the second dose which is when your efficacy starts to get above 90% in a particular person and you're, you're thought to be immune 
I think it's seven days after the second dose. Now this is a whole difficult conversation of its own and to be honest it's not something that I'm especially qualified or indeed at all qualified to talk about. I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a doctor. But there have been some parties who think this is a very bad idea. The US Food and Drug Administration, um, Dr Fauci I know doesn't think it's a very good idea even the manufacturers themselves, the people who run the trials, because we simply don't have the data to support spreading out the doses in this way. However, the UK's four chief medical officers have decided to give this the go-ahead, and there are many, many vocal scientists around the world who think this is a perfectly fine idea. So take it all with a pinch of salt, do your own reading, but it's not honestly something I can comment too much on here. Again, I do think it becomes more difficult when people have been consented for two doses of the vaccine and then they only receive one. Are you undermining patient autonomy? Yeah, I think you probably are, but again, difficult conversation to have another time. This vaccine, unlike the Oxford AstraZeneca one, has to be stored between minus 60 and minus 80 degrees Celsius. That's something that the UK's standard cold supply chain can't deal with especially easily. It's not easy to transport something at those very, very cold temperatures and keep them stable. And it's also the case that once this vaccine has been thawed out and diluted down, so you can give five doses per vial, I think you get, you have to use it within six hours or it perishes and it's no longer effective. So this makes it very difficult logistically to manage giving out this vaccine at scale. Thankfully with the Oxford AstraZeneca one, that can be stored at much closer to normal fridge temperatures. So that's gonna be significantly easier to transport and keep stable. But this is just one of the, again, very complicated things that we need to consider. And the last thing I'm gonna say is that when you receive the vaccine, you get something like this, information for UK recipients of the Pfizer vaccine. I'll actually scan these and put them on screen for you now so that you can uh, read them if you like. I'll put them in the blog post that goes along with this video as well if you want to spend a bit more time reading them. But it just covers what you need to know before receiving it, how it's actually given, possible side effects, the ingredients list, because that's something that a lot of people have decided they're very interested in. I don't really understand why, to be perfectly honest, because we, we put a million things into our bodies every day without fully checking the ingredients list but whatever the ingredients are there if you would like them but like i said before guys ask questions if you have them not to me but to people who are qualified to answer your questions because personally i'm a little bit worried that we will have so many people that aren't willing to take the vaccine that we will not reach our herd immunity threshold and the vaccine won't work effectively. It only works, as do all vaccines, if you have enough people in the population immune to the virus. And we know that people who develop antibodies themselves from having coronavirus, those antibodies don't appear to last forever. We don't know why, I don't believe, but this is why getting a good vaccine in place is really important. I'm a little worried. Things are really bad, right? ITUs are getting overrun. The NHS is getting overrun the situation is bad and we need to do something. A vaccine is one of the best ways to do something, but it only works if we all engage. Same with the public health measures, wash your hands, wear a mask, stay at home, work from home if you can, all the rest of it. But thanks very much for watching guys, that's where we'll wrap it up for now. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out my website, olliburton.com, for more free information and resources just like this video. Take care and I'll see you next time. Thanks very much for watching guys. There are three ways you can support the channel if you so wish. The first is by liking, commenting and subscribing. The second is by buying me a coffee using my Ko-Fi link in the description below. It'll help keep me awake during the editing process. And you can use my referral link to save 10% off your first year's subscription to Complete Anatomy 2021. And I'll get a small kickback when you do. Thanks very much guys. Take care and I will see you in the next video.